And just so everybody is aware, there is a strict timeline on, on these, and that will include the questions. So probably a, a clock will go up. Thank you for coming, and we are in your hands. Historic Places Trust. Uh, and with me today I, I have Dave Margetts and Mike Vincent. Uh, I provided copies of a report we produced for councillors uh, two weeks ago, which we provided to your staff, so I hope you've had a chance to read that. I'm just going to quickly run through the, the role of the Historic Places Trust um, in general terms and since the period of the earthquakes. And I'm going to quickly run through to you some statistics, which hopefully you'll find uh, of interest, and really then look just to leave you with uh, some key messages from, from our perspective. So the Historic Places Trust is an autonomous crown entity. Uh, if you could bring up the next slide, please. It's approximately 80% funded by the Crown through the Ministry of Culture and Heritage. We operate under the requirements of the Crown Entities Act and the Historic Places Act. Uh, the organisation is governed by a board mostly appointed by the Minister for Arts, Culture and Heritage, Minister Finlayson, uh, and incorporates Maori Heritage Council. As an autonomous, uh, autonomous Crown entity, is not subject to direction by the government on matters of heritage policy. Uh, immediately after the 2010 earthquake event, uh, staff set about contacting over 500 heritage building owners in Canterbury to provide free expert heritage and structural engineering advice. Uh, we've also been providing heritage assessments and individual reports to the Earthquake Recovery Authority and to the CCDU to inform their decision making in respect of them exercising uh, Section 38 of their Act. Uh, our normal and ongoing role was to assist in the long term survival of highly significant heritage places, Wahi Tapu and Wahi Tupuna, and archaeological sites. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, we also uh, give support to district councils um, through the Resource Management Act, uh, recognising that it is the councils and environment court who are the decision makers in respect of our protection of heritage. Uh, we also provide incentive funding for the conservation of Category 1 and Wahitapu entries on the New Zealand Historic Places Trust Register, uh, and we're providing input and support to the Canterbury Earthquake Heritage Fund. Uh, we're also a property owner. Uh, responsible for 48 heritage properties located throughout New Zealand, uh, which are managed as a cultural tourism uh, attraction and notably uh, the Time Wall Station in Littleton. Okay, just to quickly run through some statistics. Uh, we've broken this down across the Christchurch City Council geographical area to uh, Christchurch uh, central uh, registrations and what you'll see there is um, a pretty close split between what is our understanding of what has been retained or retention is likely through discussion with Sarah and the CCDU and what has been demolished. Uh, there is still quite a large portion there, 14% uh, and 2% of uh, heritage sites at risk or, um, or where the situation simply is not known. These figures um, are measured against uh, the New Zealand Historic Places Trust Register uh, just prior to the earthquakes and therefore differ to the statistics being produced for the Earthquake Recovery Minister uh, through the SERA reports which baseline July 2012 was their point of start. So it ignores the fact that quite significant numbers of historic buildings were, were demolished prior to that point. These statistics are also slightly skewed at the fact that Christ College and the Arts Centre both represent 20 registered historic sites between the two locations because of multiple registrations. So that again um, probably highlights more retention than is actually the case. Uh, if you go to the next slide please. Uh, that there is looking at um, outer Christchurch, so outside the, or the central Christchurch, so outside the four avenues. And you can see there, um, on that one also does not include Banks Peninsula or, uh, or Littleton. So again, uh, showing um, quite a, a relatively small portion of retention, definite or likely, uh, a huge portion at 32% where the situation simply is not known. 
and that is through uh, discussion with uh, property owners and the Earthquake Recovery Authority uh, position at, at this point uh, being unclear. Uh, the next slide, please. Again, looking at Littleton, um, retention uh, definite around 37% of historic um, sites. Quite a large portion, 35% uh, already demolished, and again, uh, getting close to 30% where uh, we believe are at risk or simply still not known. Uh, moving on to the next slide, is broken down just as Banks Peninsula, much more positive, but with uh, lesser items and lots of registrations though through Akara of old uh, wooden buildings in uh, particular. So the situation there much better. Uh, the next slide, please. Christchurch City as a whole. So you can see there, 47% um, retention definite or likely. Um, so over half um, of Christchurch of 501 um, registered historic sites either demolished, uh, the situation unknown or at risk. And again, um, a large portion over quarter where we simply don't know what the situation is or um, we believe they're, they're still at risk. So just to uh, the final slide there, please. Thank you. Um, so really the, the key thing I just wanted to, to leave with you was um, the situation uh, under your term as council um, will be, uh, we're teetering around the 50% loss, and it's which side of that mark do we go? Will we end up with over half the historic sites of Christchurch lost? Or, or will it be better than that? And there is a large portion in the order of 20 to 30 per cent where um, the situation is, is, is where there are sites still at risk. Um, three years on, which uh, in some case may be due to safety, they may be due to economic or other social reasons as determined um, by, by others. We uh, look forward to continuing to work with Christchurch City Council staff and the heritage team, Helen and Philip Barrett, who uh, we've, uh, our staff have worked very closely with. Uh, and also we've um, you know, been working closely with the neighbouring districts of Selwyn and Waimakariri. I think I'll just leave it there and uh, if there's any questions. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. from Councillor Livingston, and apologies for lateness from Councillor Menji. <laughs> They're both accepted. Um, I also should just let people who are submitting know that this has been live streamed. Um, just <laughs> I should have let you know beforehand. <laughs> My apologies. Are there any questions? Councillor Clearwater, then Councillor Turner. Thank you for your presentation. Can you let us know how the talks regarding the, the cathedral might be progressing in any way, and, and what ways, ways Council might um, support you with those. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question, uh, Councillor. Uh, to date, there's nothing to report. We've received uh, no feedback from the owner of the cathedral, uh, the Church Property Trustees. Okay. But we have had engagement um, with the Greater Christchurch Building Trust, who um, are, are keen to engage in some form of talks. Thank you. Um, I'm guessing that the buildings which have been demolished have been for a number of reasons, some of them because they were dangerous, um, some of them as a result of um, Section 38 notices issued by CIRA. Do you have a point of contact within CIRA and do you have an open line of communication that's, that's working? Are you able to make some comments on that, please? Yeah, we um, very uh, early on in the process, uh, Dave Margetz is a, is a specialist uh, heritage architect, was uh, sitting within the CIRA uh, operations team advising. Um, we produce reports uh, for them on the heritage significance and we often give some commentary over the information provided in engineering reports or the positions of the, the owner uh, for Sarah to, to make that decision. Um, and we have had um, regular-ish meetings with the Earthquake Recovery Authority throughout uh, periods of time over the last three years where we uh, get updates. It, it's not perfect, the communications, but it's there and we have a good level of contact and working relationship with them. But ultimately the decision is with them. Thank you. Um, several questions, but thanks for the work that you're doing. Um, pretty bleak statistics, really. Um, have you got any idea about the number that have 
that could have been repaired that have been demolished versus the ones that were just you know, destroyed in the earthquake or beyond um, any sense of repair? Um, I don't, um, but, but like all these things, I mean, it, in, any building can be fixed if you're prepared to throw enough money at it. Um, and I guess that's the difficulty and it's, it's, it's where that balance is found. And, and I guess that's been the, the challenge you know, for the Earthquake Recovery Authority. And I know, uh, you know there's many cases that you know, they, they have taken their time, they've looked carefully um, at the information that's been provided to them before these decisions are made. Um, so, so, so I guess ultimately the answer is, is, is no. Right. Um, second question is, um, I, I, I note that there's no mention of here um, around what's happening in the red zone. Do you have any listed heritage properties within the red zone? Um, uh, within Christchurch City, no. Uh, Waimakariri District, uh, we have a three remaining buildings, but in Christchurch City, no. Okay, and, and that follows on to my next question, is how proactive have you been post-earthquake in listing new buildings because of the, the impact of the earthquake and the loss of so much? And, identifying any new, new buildings that should have greater protection given our yeah, circumstances? That's a really good question. We have not been proactive at all at registering new buildings. We have, um, have, have taken a view to not go down that route, whilst, particularly whilst there's been uncertainty with insurance companies and owners, and, it, and it's often seen as, as, as being interference or um, unnecessarily, perhaps. So uh, to this stage, we've not. We've not been looking at uh, new registrations, and right. it's, it's also an internal resourcing issue as well. About okay. so I, that. I'm glad you mentioned the resourcing. I look in here, and you say you're getting more emergency applications for archaeological yes. sites. Um, do we need to be asking government for more resource for you to actually be able to deal with the archaeological sites and possibly do new listings and actually be be able to be a little bit more proactive? I just it's quite concerning to hear some of the developers complaining about you know, how long it takes and what a disruption mm -hmm. it is. But some of us have also heard that people don't feel that enough is being done around archaeological sites yeah. um, and that it's just kind of seen as a you know, thing that people go through a process but there's actually no real meaning given to. Yeah. There's, um, under the Order in Council, uh, we have three days to turn mm -hmm. around uh, an application. Um, we have processed with one member of staff, one archaeologist who's supported now by one other person. Uh, he's been uh, the same person throughout the whole process. He has not missed a deadline of turning uh, an application around within three days. He's now processed in excess of 1,700 applications. Um, there has been an increase. We have, um, under the order in council, there's a designated emergency Canterbury archaeologist. Uh, so I now have also people designated in Kerry, Kerry, Wellington and Dunedin to help support whilst, um, yeah, really since about November, the, um, the applications started to increase, particularly as we get into the, the red zone in the Port Hills. And, and, and just help me understand, like, why someone, you know, given that the earthquakes happened quite a while ago, yep. why they'd need an emergency archaeological investigation rather than a kind of normal... Yeah, the, the, there's not a huge amount of difference other than it's just the time frames on us to, to respond. Um, I, I think... And we're, we're trying to be uh, and are being as pragmatic as we can to turn them around quickly. And we have not been as, and simply through resourcing and, and through trying to assist developers and people recover, we have not been as stringent in chasing or checking uh, reports of fines as we might otherwise have done. Right. Um, and I think that's been uh, correct and proper. So just a final question is, we're losing a lot of heritage, there's a lot more to be, um, is at risk, um, is, we're, we're still waiting for the heritage recovery program, it's you know, taking a lot, lot longer than any of us would have liked, what is it short of a moratorium, you know, getting government to put a moratorium on the demolition of uh, listed heritage buildings, both yours and, and ours, um, is there any, I mean, and they've obviously said that they won't do that, um, is there anything else you think we should be doing as a city to try and save our heritage? Is there anything we can do to either help you or we should be doing ourselves to, to try and halt this really concerning trend? Yeah, I think um, there's some interesting statistics um, overseas at rental returns on historic buildings and often in uh, central cities, um, older character buildings 
um, get a higher rental return than the newer buildings. So I guess it's ensuring that all the information is presented to the, to the owner um, when they're in discussions with the Earthquake Recovery Authority around the future of that building to ensure I think all factors are being, are being properly considered. Um, you know, there's, the situation confronting Christchurch was one where not all buildings could have been saved. Um, so identifying really what, what are the key city assets that we wish to uh, make some effort to protect uh, was key. Um, clearly we still have a number of, of key assets in sitting in you know, the two cathedrals where the future is uncertain. Um, you, know, you could probably put the public trust building in that category in, 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 in the claimed mansion. Um, so, it, so it's really ensuring every opportunity is given to, to ensure um, an option can be found to, to save those buildings uh, and that the right people are, are engaged in those discussions. Thank you for that. That was really interesting. Um, I heard someone speak last night at an event and he was saying that one of the major issues as he sees it in the uh, retention and fighting for buildings is that people don't understand the value in heritage buildings, that these days it's all about building code, hopefully it'll stand up, let's make sure we get out of the building and are safe, and then we look back and decide whether it can be saved or not. Do you think that there is something that, uh, following on from what Councillor Johansson said, something the Council can do to help you or perhaps you can do strategically to actually inform people, to educate them on the value of the buildings? When you look at the Greeks, you look at the Romans, look at how much they valued their buildings, how well they stood. Mm -hmm. Is there a bigger issue around that as well? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question, Councillor. We, we've, um, with, with, a, with a limited resource and, and very much with the Council um, Heritage Response Team, have uh, worked with uh, property owners to help inform them of that. We've provided information. We've, we've, we've had info on our website of preferred, well, recommended suppliers that, can, uh, that, that have knowledge in working with um, particularly older buildings and unreinforced masonry buildings. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, we, we've, we've tried. I'm thinking more actually in an advertising, promotional right. way so that yep. you can get some understanding and support from the public because mm -hmm. clearly that kind of pressure and, and support from the public yep. may help change the stance of some of the developers who are keen to just let them go. Right. Okay, well that's a, that's a good idea. Yes, no, thank you. Um, yeah, no, I don't think so. Other, other than I think you know, we, we need to continually work with uh, with council staff at um, um, you know trying to influence owners where we can, and indeed um, with with the earthquake recovery authority and, and the CCDU as they progress plans in the blueprint project areas to ensure um, our remaining heritage is um, you know enhances those areas. Thank you. If I may, um, I just wondered if you if you are aware of the High Street Stories app. Would you like to give them? A oh, great! Yeah, no, look, thank you. Because it's Councillor. wonderful. Yep. So. Oh, we've produced a, a, uh, an, uh, an augmented reality app for uh, for High Street, which has a couple of hundred stories on there from uh, from 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 a, from a range of uses that the street has had in the past. Um, which which is interesting. We're trying to work with. Um, uh, Tourism, Canterbury, and also members of the council to see if we can do something similar for Regent Street, New Regent Street as well. Um, yeah. yeah, look, I, I'll, I can send something through with an app, but this, yes, yeah, well, there's, there's a website, um, or at the moment it's not on iOS, it's, um, it's only on tablet format. <laughs> yeah, I know, dreadful. Um, yeah. I was, I was horrified to see how much it cost to flick it across to iOS, but we were waiting for it to, for iOS 7 to update. But you can, you can, you can pan around High Street, see images uh, of, um, of, of as it was, and uh, it comes up with targets and various interviews. But it's a tourism thing with some signage around, which you know, with QR codes that you can um, pick up these things. It really enhances the, um, you know, the post-earthquake tourism bend that Christchurch is becoming, really.
Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor.